This is Phil Kopman, and I'll be talking about how safe is safe enough for autonomous vehicles. As an overview of the talk, we'll be covering automated driving systems, ADS. In other words, you plan to hand the keys to your car over to a machine, and the machine's going to drive, potentially while you're asleep in the back seat, or possibly the machine's going to drive and you're on standby to take over when the machine notifies you that you need to take over. We're going to be talking about risk management frameworks, which is which human is a baseline driver, and risk mitigation is not the same as safety. We'll talk about uncertainty as a limiting factor for deployment. You have to predict the safety before you deploy. It's nice to know how it turned out, but you really want to make sure you're safe before you deploy. And that's going to require field feedback to manage uncertainty. We'll talk about a broader view of safe enough. It's not just how often it is between crashes. It's also some ethical considerations about the distribution of risk. And we'll come to a hierarchical model of safety needs. Safety means more than one thing all at the same time to different stakeholders. And finally, we'll have a summary of the kind of things you need to consider to be able to ethically and responsibly deploy an automated vehicle at scale. It should be no secret to anyone watching this that automated driving is sold based on safety. One company said it's a matter of trust, and they're absolutely right. People have to trust the safety of this technology to accept it. Another company said we're building a safer driver for everyone. It turns out that the companies are selling this technology to customers and regulators promising safety. But when you try and figure out what safety really means, it turns out it's really complicated. And we'll be spending this talk trying to explain all the different types of things that come into play if you want to make a claim that's credible about safety. First, do you want to really be safe enough based just on the news cycle? If you look at the news, what you hear about is the companies say, oh, we're safe, safety is number one, safety is what we care about. And you see some demos, some really impressive demo videos, but you also see crashes in the news. There was an unfortunate fatality in 2018 where an Uber ATG test vehicle, so this was not actually an autonomous vehicle, it was a test platform supervised by a safety driver, tragically cra uh, crashed into a pedestrian uh, who was walking a bicycle resulting in a fatality. That really got people thinking and asking about the safety of the technology. But again, it was a test vehicle. It was not a fully deployed vehicle. More recently, a local motors vehicle crashed into a tree, severely injuring the driver. Again, this was a, a test vehicle. But both of those, the headlines amounted to self-driving car results in a, in a bad crash. And people came away with questioning, gee, is this technology safe? These are both crude testing. Uh, and neither one was actually a deployed vehicle. Now, since these have happened, there have been crashes involving injuries to deployed vehicles that do not have a driver in the cabin. But again, they make the news, and the question is, well, how safe is it? And you can count up the number of crashes in the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration NHTSA database that are piling up. But if you don't know how many miles were involved in the testing you don't really have a crash rate. It's really hard to know what it means. You need a denominator for the crash reports as well. So while the news tell us the technology is perfect, no one really expected it to be perfect. And the question is, how do you evaluate these kind of data points? Well, you need a bigger picture. The crash rates in the news aren't enough. You need to be much more thorough, especially if you want to predict safety before they deploy instead of after they deploy. Now, as an aside, it's important to realize that one of the dynamics in all these crash reports is the blame game. Companies especially love to blame humans for the bad news. Human driver, human pedestrian jumped out in front of the car, human driver is supposed to be paying attention and didn't, the other human driver hit our car. And, and while there may be some truth to some of that, blame doesn't make you safe. So let's take a look. The first ethical problem we're going to talk about, among several, is the blame game. Humans are terrible at supervising autonomy. That includes driver assistance systems where you take your hands off the wheel or you leave your hands on the wheel, but your mind wanders a little bit, and you're using an autopilot-like system on the highway, to being a tester in a fully autonomous system, but your job is to jump in and save the day if something goes wrong. Humans are really bad at that. Now, if you have a trained monitor test driver, 
they can be good enough that, that it's okay. But this is a serious thing that requires serious effort. You can't just take a random driver with no training, no supervision, and expect them to pay attention. That's just an unreasonable ask. The industry is betting that driver monitoring is going to solve the attention problem, and we're going to see how that turns out. But the other alternative that you also see used is the moral crumple zone. So the idea of a moral crumple zone is we know that our automation is going to have problems, but our plan is not to necessarily fix the automation because we want to deploy. Our plan is to find a convenient human and blame them instead. That's the moral crumple zone. This is really bad. Some companies are basically doing this and they shouldn't be. That's a real ethical problem. If you want to have a robo taxi or a robo car, a robot driving a car, whether it's a, a cute robot sitting in the driver's seat or built into the car, either way, you, you need to figure out what your plan is to manage responsibility and accountability. Now, one of the things we've seen recently in some state regulations is a strategy where they say the computer is the driver, or sometimes a company is the driver, but the company's not a legal person, it's just this fictitious entity. Either way, there's literally nobody at fault if there's a crash. Now, while that may make it easier to deploy the technology, the question has to arise, if there's a crash where a human driver would have gone to jail for negligence, what's your plan when it's a computer? Does the computer get a free pass? Where's the accountability? How do you make sure that there's no um, incentive to just deploy uh, things that might not be as safe as they should be, simply because you know nobody's going to jail? So that's a, an ethics question, and most of the ethics question in this talk we're going to sort of leave open for you to think about. Okay, so people say, let's have a driver test. Driver tests work for people. Why wouldn't it work for a robot? Well, it mostly works for a robot, but there's a really big thing it doesn't handle, and, and that's actually the biggest thing. But let's go through. If you have a, a driver test for a person, there's a bunch of things going on. You get the driver's manual. The person reads the driver's manual. They take a written test. Do they know the laws and behaviors? And I can certainly believe that a bunch of uh, software developers can figure out the, the rules of the road. It, it turns out to be a little tricky because a lot of the road law is actually do the right thing. And I know this is the rule, but it's okay to, be, to, to bend or modify the rule if there's a compelling reason. If there's a tree down in your lane, is it okay to go over the double yellow line to go around the tree? Yeah, yeah, probably okay as long as nobody's coming. There's actually a lot of do the right thing and apply common sense. But nonetheless, the rules are written down. Uh, certainly a computer can be taught the rules. Uh, maybe some adjustments need to be made, but that's sort of a different talk. You then take a road test. You take the car out on the road. Uh, there's a driving examiner in the car, and the driving examiner says, turn left here, turn right here, and observes how the car behaves. Do some parallel parking, display mastery of being able to control the vehicle, display mastery of being able to interact with other drivers on the road. Okay, I can believe once we've settled what do the right thing means in interesting situations that an automated driving system should be able to obey traffic laws. Uh, it We'll have to learn how to effectively negotiate with human drivers in, in unclear situations, such as their four cars all stopped at a four-way stop, who goes first? But again, that can be figured out. And it will have to deal with potentially ambiguous situations, but, but that's okay. Let's say that the technical folks solve all those problems, and you run this driver test. Is that enough to license a vehicle? No, there's something missing. What's missing is maturity of judgment. We'll see later that maturity matters a lot for safety. So what's the piece in the driver test that is a proxy for maturity of judgment? Well, it's being 16 years old and being a human. By the time you're 16, you may not have the most mature judgment in the world, but you've, you've reached a level, especially with a starter's or junior driver license and, and being limited to driving during the day, things like this. You've reached a level that society's comfortable. You're pretty good at figuring out when things are going strange. You're pretty good at deciding what's going to happen next so you can avoid trouble. So a big part of a driver test is the birth certificate that proves you're a 16-year-old human. Well, how do we do that for an automated driving system? We're certainly not going to just load it into a car and come back 16 years later and assume it's a driver. That, that'd be ridiculous. So how do we get a proxy for maturity of judgment? And there's no way to really test that effectively that anyone's figured out. Autonomous systems in particular are going to struggle with novelty and unknowns. They're really terrible at not knowing when they don't know what's going on. And humans, while not perfect, are pretty good at saying, 
What the heck was that? I think I'll slow down until I figure it out. So we're going to need safety engineering, not just a driver test, but the maturity of judgment is going to end up requiring some safety engineering beyond just going out and doing a bunch of training, doing a bunch of testing. If we're going to do safety engineering, we need a risk goal. We need to understand how much risk we're willing to accept to understand how safe is safe enough. And to do that, we need a framework for expressing the risk. It turns out there are multiple different ways to think about how much risk might be enough. One of them is minimum endogenous mortality. The idea here is that everyday life has a certain amount of risk, and especially when you're younger and uh, old age diseases are not a, a big factor on mortality rates, there's a certain risk that people will die from whatever reason. Think of it as a background risk of living our society. And the idea of MEM is if you're going to build a system, that system should not significantly increase the risk to the population. Well, it turns out that driving in ordinary cars is a non-negligible risk. There's a significant risk there. Saying autonomous vehicles will have negligible risk compared to all the other things that happen in life is unreasonable. I mean, that would be great. The folks who want there to be essentially zero mortalities from this technology, that's kind of what they have in mind. That's effectively zero, but that's unrealistic. There are other frameworks that are probably more likely to be used, at least in the near term, and MEM will be a much longer term goal. Another framework is ALARP, as low as reasonably practicable. There are some other concepts that are related to that. But the idea here is that you reduce any risks identified unless the cost is extreme. How extreme is extreme is an interesting question, but you're expected to spend a lot more to reduce risks if it's feasible to do so compared to just paying out the insurance costs or something like that. So if there's a way to reduce risk and it's practicable to do so, you need to do it. Another less rigorous way of thinking about risk is NMAU, which is reducing the identified risks within a reasonable cost. So here the bar is set a little bit lower, as long as you know how to reduce the risk and the cost is reasonable, you have to do so. Uh, so it's along the lines of ALARP, but the bar is kind of set lower. The issue here, which is also true of ALARP, but especially here, is what if we don't know how to build something safe? If you build something and reduce the risk within reason, it might end up being unacceptably dangerous for society. So these are principles you're going to want to see. Certainly, if there's a way to make something safer that's not expensive, you should do so. But it doesn't mean that it's going to be safe enough for societal acceptance. We need to have something a little bit stronger than that. There's the classic engineering approaches, safety integrity levels in automotive. It's automotive safety integrity levels, ASIL, which are associated with the standard ISO 26262 that we'll talk about later. And the idea there is not to actually measure the risk at least in that standard, but rather to say, here's what the risk is, and we have a menu of engineering approaches we're going to apply, and the more risk, the more engineering approaches we apply to mitigate the risk to something that we think will be acceptable. So it's not actually a measurement of the risk itself, but rather an engineering methodology to bring rigor to the table when there's high risk. We'll probably see this used, but as with other techniques, this may not be enough because it's not specifically designed to cover the machine learning technology that's behind autonomous vehicles. So it's a piece, but it's not going to be the final acceptance criteria, probably. The final acceptance criteria is probably using the GAMAB risk framework. The idea here is you take an existing system, human-driven vehicles, and you say, well, we're going to build a new system to replace it. And the concept is the new system will be at least as good as the old system. So when you hear people talking about, well, as long as it's as safe as a human driver, then it's okay, they're talking about a GAMAB approach. In the automotive world, you often hear positive risk balance, PRB, which is a GAMAB approach that's utilitarian. It says, take a look at the net risk of human drivers, and as long as you're at least as good or no worse than them, then it should be okay. Well, what are the numbers? The numbers from 2019 in the U.S. are 36,000 fatalities. That's gotten a bit higher in the last couple of years, although it's unclear if that's a temporary or permanent increase. But still, 36,000, 40,000 fatalities is a lot of fatalities for the population. However, if you look at it on a per-mile basis, one fatality per 100 million miles is actually pretty impressive for anything to be able to drive in a chaotic world. 
there are a lot of injuries. Many of those injuries are, are certainly life-altering. So reducing the injuries is just as important as reducing the fatalities uh, and, and quite a number of crashes. So this is sort of our baseline. If you want to say no worse than a human driver, these are the kind of numbers you're working with. By the way, it's important to realize these numbers include drunk drivers, speeders, no seat belts. We'll get to that on the next slide, but you need to start thinking about what, what does it mean to have a baseline driver? Do you want to be as good as the average driver, or, or maybe you need to be better than that? We'll get to that in a moment. As an aside, while you're testing, if a test program has 10 million miles, on average, that means you should only have about a tenth of a fatality. That means that most companies should expect zero fatalities from their testing. The notion that it's okay to have a fatality or two while you're developing the technology is not taking a look at the numbers. If testing should be no more dangerous than other human drivers, that means almost no company should have any fatalities at all during their test program. But given all these things going on with all these drivers that are not ideal drivers, which driver do you pick as an average? And under what conditions driving which vehicle? So let's go into that for a moment. In round numbers, it's about 100 million miles per fatal mishap. Uh, the number was 1.1 fatalities per 100 million miles, but sometimes there's two people involved in a crash. So we're going to round it off to 100 million miles per, per fatality just to, to keep the numbers round. Out of those, 28% involve alcohol or driving under the influence. 26% are speed related. 9% are distracted driving. You'll hear people say distracted driving is the biggest problem. It's a 10% kind of problem, which certainly matters, but it's not the biggest, not by a lot. So if you add these up, you get more than 50%, but if you draw a Venn diagram, there's a lot of overlap. Yeah, let's call it half have something that has to do with uh, driver misbehavior, approximately. Now, this is bad. This should be improved for human drivers, and these are U.S. numbers. In Europe, things like alcohol-related crashes are a lot better in many countries. Uh, so we could do better even without self-driving vehicles, uh, but let's just say that that's the number. Something to keep in mind, if you've heard the 94% meme, people will say 94% of crashes are due to humans making mistakes. Well, these numbers don't support that. It's a lot less than 94%. So the bad news for automated vehicles is a lot of the crashes aren't just humans driving drunk. So it's a really hard task and humans aren't perfect at it. A challenge for automated vehicles is that fully functional humans are a lot better than 100 million miles. Let's call it 200 million miles per fatal mishap in really round numbers. Do you really want your self-driving car to be as good as a drunk, speeding, distracted driver? You know, I think not. And so when you set the how good is good enough, you probably want a fully functional driver, not someone who's driving under the influence. You also probably want to compare apples to apples against other cars that are similar. The US average fleet is something like 12 years old. So do you really want your brand new expensive car that has all these safety features in it to be the same safety as a 12 year old car that doesn't have good airbags, does not have automatic emergency braking, and all these other things? No, you probably want to compare it, you should be comparing it against another new car that has all the other safety features not associated with the automated driving. If you have any lock brakes and stability control and really good airbags and automatic emergency braking, you should be comparing against the car that's driven by a human that also has those same capabilities. So you don't want to be better than just any old driver. You want to be better than an unimpaired, undistracted driver driving a vehicle with comparable safety equipment that has nothing to do with the automated driving. Another effect is driver age. Uh, now, if you look at uh, what happens in some court cases, you'll see graphs like this shown where they say, oh, look at those older drivers. They have a lot more crash rates and the fatality rate goes up. Well, there's a couple things going on here. One of them is the fatality rate goes up because old people have more trouble surviving crashes. But the other more insidious thing going on is I'm only showing you the graph from 30 years and older. If you really want to understand crash rates, you need to look at the graph on another scale that shows you all the drivers. And there's the same graph. It's shrunk down just because I changed the scale. So if you say, oh, those 70 year old drivers, I don't know, they're old. I don't, I don't know if they're a good driver. Now, to be sure, we've all heard stories or maybe seen something about an older driver and we blamed it on age. But Age isn't actually the problem on average. Older drivers are awesome. It's the younger drivers you have to worry about. And so the 16-year-olds, 18-year-olds have really high crash rates. 
So that's interesting. Do you really want to be as good as an 18 year old? You know, by this graph, I'm going to say, no, you want to be as good as a 40, 50, 60 year old. Uh, the older drivers are actually better. So you want to be old, better than a middle aged driver. There's an implication here that's really interesting. People have said that automated vehicles will be better than human drivers because they have faster reaction time. I'm going to say that my Twitch response for video games is nowhere near as good as an 18 year old. Uh, but I'm in the demographic that's a lot safer driver. So what's going on there? Well, it strongly suggests that response time is not the governing factor for driving safety. What's the governing dri factor for driving safety is probably driver maturity. Older drivers are smart enough not to go up that icy hill behind that giant truck that's going to slide back into them. Uh, lots of younger drivers, including me, have, have made that mistake once, but we learn not to do it again. Now, there's lots of things that you can do that have nothing to do with responding to avoid a crash, but rather not putting yourself into a position where the crash will happen. So you probably want to say, which driver am I better than? Well, probably a middle-aged driver with some experience. The place you're driving also matters. You can say, all right, we're better than the average U.S. driver, and I put some U.S. numbers down. Uh, in some places, you look at deaths per 100,000 people. But you could argue that uh, big countries like the U.S., people drive more miles for whatever reason. And you can look at deaths per 100 million miles. We'll look at it both ways. Well, that number is for the whole country, but it turns out there's a lot of variation. In deaths per 100,000 people, there's almost an eight times variation between District of Columbia and Wyoming. In terms of deaths per 100 million miles, there's a, almost a three and a half times variation between Massachusetts and South Carolina. So if you're driving in Massachusetts and you say, oh, our deaths per 100 million miles is 1.11, same as the U.S., you're actually twice as dangerous as the Massachusetts drivers. The crash types also matter. In D.C., they have the highest pedestrian rate. So of their fatalities, which is quite low per 100,000 people, 39% of, of pedestrians, well, and if you've been to D.C., there's pedestrians all over the place. But if you're going to break down the fatalities by how many are pedestrians, how many are vehicle occupants, how many are other, you need to know what the numbers are because you don't want to be worse than the local drivers and claim you are better than them. It doesn't make sense. New York, Florida, Delaware have uh, bicycle fatalities at the highest rate, and urban versus rural has a two-to-one variation. So the place you're driving, the location, the, the county, the zip code, as well as the type of road you're on, significantly and dramatically affects what the baseline risk is going to be for a human driver. And let's not even get into day versus night and rain versus sun. Those are going to have significant effects on the crash rates. The takeaway here is you need to be as good as a human driver in comparable conditions, or else you could be sort of cooking the books here by saying, well, I'm better than average, but you're driving in a place where all the drivers are better than average, and you turn out to be worse than the humans. Now let's talk about when we deploy. Assume we figured out what baseline human driver we want to compare ourselves against. They're competent, unimpaired, middle-aged driver in the same operational conditions, the same quality of vehicle, all those kind of things. Uh, so now we finally have our positive risk balance baseline. Now, when do we deploy? Well, there's a RAND report that says you only need to be 10% better than the human driver for it to be a safety win to deploy. And they looked a lot at a lot of sensitivity analysis and said, all right, if you're 10% better now, how fast will you get even better than a human and all these things? Uh, and as far as it goes, the report is great. And intuitively, you say, well, you know, as long as we're only a little bit better than a human driver, we're going to kill fewer people. And so from a purely utilitarian point of view, it kind of makes sense to deploy. We're going to save lives. That, that'll literally be true even at 1% better. Okay, so far. But there's something the report did not go into that also matters for the numbers, and that is the variation of the risk. You know the average, but you actually know whether your prediction of your risk is going to be what you actually experience. So what if you say you're 10% better, but you're really wrong about that? You could be more dangerous, and that's something you have to take into account. You just can't assume that you're going to have a perfect estimate. What if your estimate's five times too optimistic? Well, you'll be five times minus 10% more dangerous than a human driver. That's going to be a problem. So you need to address uncertainty. Now, you can't completely eliminate uncertainty, 
but you can't pretend it doesn't exist. There will be uncertainty in your safety estimate, and it's important to responsibly account for it. One way to get rid of uncertainty is to get statistical significance in your estimate. So this slide talks about why you're not going to get it. Let's say that you've said your goal is 200 million miles between critical mishaps, and you've compared that to a baseline human drivers, and you say that's our goal. So that's a, a hypothetical, but it's probably in the ballpark. In order to get statistical significance of a purely testing-based approach, now people wouldn't do this, but I'm going to explain why, you would need 2 billion miles of testing. And if you ask Wolfram Alpha, that's 50 round trips on every paved road in the world. Uh, yeah, that's not going to happen. You have to have fewer than 10 critical mishaps, and, and so you get statistical significance. Okay, great, but it's not going to happen. Oh, and by the way, if you find a defect and redo your system, you're going to have to do at least some of the testing, perhaps all of it. This is just not going to work out. So any amount of road testing you can afford is going to leave uncertainty because you cannot afford to brute force it. Now, people have figured this out, but I want to go back to basics and explain why road testing will not actually get you to safe. What people often do is say, oh, we do a lot of simulation instead. Simulation is way cheaper than road testing. It's really scalable. You fire up a server farm, you run your simulations. Sure, this is a fidelity versus cost trade-off, but you can figure it out. Bring lots of money, you'll do lots of simulation. Maybe you can get those billions of miles of simulation. Well, how far does that get you? It gets you some of the way, but not all of the way. You're going to have to build highly detailed models, and there will be modeling errors. So now the simulator is safety critical software because if the simulator has a flaw, your answers would be wrong. What if your models are missing something? What if your models are missing people wearing yellow? This is a problem that we've seen in perception systems. They struggled with people dressed in yellow. If you don't know that's an issue and you don't put yellow clothing on the simulated people in your model, you won't find out till you get the real world that you're missing people dressed in yellow. There's also a challenge of matching real-world data to simulation models. There's a process called re-simulation where you take the real-world data, you backfit it to the simulation models, and you see how they fit up. And it turns out that's really tricky to do well, although that's something that can be solved. But the biggest thing is it only tests the things you've thought of. If you haven't modeled kangaroos in your simulated world, then you're, gonna, you're in for a real treat when you find the first kangaroo in the real world, and that's a real story that happened to a company that their system just lost it when it saw the kangaroo. And, and sure, now that everyone's heard that story, they'll put kangaroos in. But it turns out there's a huge number of surprises that you probably won't even see during testing, so they won't be in your simulator. So no matter how much money you put in a simulation, there'll still be some residual uncertainty, although simulation is better than brute force road testing for trying to reduce that. In the end, you've done some engineering, you've done your simulation, you've done your road testing, you may end up with a reason we think we're safe because we've done all these things. Now that you've done everything and you say it's time to deploy on the real world with no safety drivers, we're going to put the vehicles out there, how do you know, how do you have confidence that you're not going to hit the kid in the yellow shirt chasing a ball into the street on a residential street? And the argument is going to be, well, we did a lot of simulation, we did a lot of testing. But the counter argument is going to be something like this. Yes, you did 10 billion miles of simulation. That's awesome. But was there a simulator error? How do you know there's no simulation error? And you did 100 million miles of road data collected to feed into the simulation, but it was only 100 million miles. Maybe there's a once in every 200 million miles that leads to a fatal crash that you never saw, and so you didn't put in the simulation. Maybe there's a lot of things like that. So how do you know that you caught all the scenarios and all the objects? And you validated it by 10 million miles of road testing, that's great, that's impressive, but at 10 million miles of road testing, you're just not going to see stuff that happens every 100 million miles. And you did tens of thousands of repetitions on closed course testing of the tricky things that you can't reproduce in the world. Again, that's great, but you use dummies of kids instead of real kids. Now, dummies are what you should use in the closed course to be sure you don't want to put kids in danger, but there's always the chance there'll be something different about real kids. Maybe none of your dummies had a red hat on, and maybe that causes a problem with perception. Who can know until you do it? Maybe your perception training data was biased. It didn't have any red hats in it. How do you know about that? Oh, and for all this, you used software binaries and tools you downloaded off the web or developed yourself, but you didn't use safety-critical techniques for validating them. 
all these things are challenges. Now, I hope that any company that puts a vehicle on the road without a driver has addressed all these challenges. But these are the kind of things you have to think about beyond just, oh, it drove around and it seemed to drive okay. This is all the engineering challenge to make sure that this stuff goes beyond just sort of working into being really safe. We're talking about engineering rigor. Testing alone is not enough for life critical systems. We've known this for decades because the numbers are just too big. So the only way we know how to assure safety is to not only do testing, but also use engineering rigor. You need to be able to trust the system itself. You need to make sure you're using good safety engineering. You have to follow standards and best practices. You need to write it down. If it's not written on paper, it didn't happen. And you want a safety case, a structured argument explaining why it should be safe. We'll come back to that. And you ask, can you trust your validation process? Sure, we drove it around, but was it a thoroughly considered design of experiments? Did you actually engineer the simulations property? Did you actually run the right simulations on a validation campaign that tested everything that needed to be tested? Those are the kind of questions you ask for engineering rigor, and you're going to have to have that for safety. Now, there's standards. I mentioned standards. The standards are out there. We don't need to invent standards to have a lot of material to work with. They're all out there. There's ISO 26262, which has to do with functional safety, and in particular, the hazard and risk analysis era, but you want to do the whole standard, not just that part of it. But in particular, it identifies and mitigates risks per automotive safety integrity levels. This standard applies to regular cars. It also applies to automated vehicles. It doesn't have anything specific about machine learning, but the steering still has to work and the brakes still have to work and the electronics still have to work. And so ISO 26262 is just as applicable for automated vehicles. ISO 21448, you identify and mitigate unsafe scenarios. This is the safety and the intended function sort of standard. And the idea is that you have a bunch of things that can happen in the outside world, and some you know how to take care of, and some you didn't think of, and they're unsafe. So those are the unknown unsafes. And the point of this standard at a really high level is to iteratively discover the things that are unknown unsafe and fix them so that they get pushed into the safe area. You deploy when that iterative process has reached an acceptable risk. I'm going to say that's great, uh, but you need to be a lot more aggressive post-deployment. Now, ISO 21448 does talk about post-deployment, but the emphasis of the standard is the design cycle, and you're going to have to work just as hard or harder after you deploy because of uncertainty. I think what you're going to really need for this technology to work in the real world is field engineering feedback. You're going to have a risk that has a mean, but it has uncertainty. You deploy when the mean is acceptable, but what you really want to do is deploy when the mean and reasonable uncertainty are both acceptable. You're going to have missed edge cases during road testing. That sort of process is going to just not see some things because they just don't happen often enough for you to see during any reasonable testing. You're going to have unknown gaps in the validation plan. You're going to have unknown unknowns in general. So you're going to do sort of go ahead, do that, but there's going to be some things left. And my prediction is there'll be enough things left that it's significant and you have to worry about it. Let's look at it this way. You have a safety goal, and there's a positive risk balance threshold, and you can say, all right, we're going to deploy when you were 10% better than PRB. Okay, that's what the RAND report suggested was okay. And that might or might not be okay, depending on the uncertainty. What if your uncertainty is way bigger than 10%? You could be deploying at much worse than a person, even though your expectation is better than a person because of the uncertainty. So to deploy, you not only need to be better than a person, but you need to have reduced the uncertainty so that there's a low probability that the uncertainty crosses down below the positive risk balance threshold, or else you could be unwittingly deploying a car that's more dangerous than people. So the solution is you have to do something about uncertainty. I would say that the, the most promising technique that I know of is safety performance indicators which are a way of not only measuring the safety of the vehicle, but the validity, the integrity of the safety case itself. If you look at surprise arrival rates and you're going out there, you're on the road testing and you're getting surprised every mile, oh, we didn't think of this, we didn't think of this, we didn't think of this, it's hard to say that your predicted safety is fine because you keep getting surprised. Uh, so you can think of that as a termination criteria for SOTIF to 
not stop soda thing until you stop getting surprises. Uh, but safety performance indicators are a way to formalize that a little more. They end up in the same place. You should look at the surprise arrival rates during validation, and I would say continue after deployment. We'll get into why that is. The ANSI UL4600 standard, also for autonomous vehicles, talks about what should be in a safety case to make sure the safety case has thought of all the things we know how to think of, and it's complete, it's valid, it's sound. It's really about how to make sure your safety case has all the did you think of that kind of things in it. It also includes SPIs as a direct measurement of a safety case claim failure. So the idea is you have a safety case that has a claim. I think we're safe because, because some reason. I think we avoid hitting pedestrians because reason. And there's an argument saying, well, that claim is true because reason one, reason two, reason three. And then the reasons have subclaims and so on down. The idea of an SPI is that it monitors the claim and says, I know at design time you argued this would never happen, and yet we just saw it happen. And so the SPI is the we just saw it happen data feed that falsifies the claim. It says, well, that claim, we thought it was true, but it, we just observed it was false. And I'm using the word falsification in the sense of a scientific method, like black swans, you know, all swans are white. Oh, there's a black one. We just falsified that claim. In this case, it's more, we said we'd be more, one meter away from pedestrians, and we were just 90 centimeters away. Does that mean you hit the pedestrian? No. Does it mean you had a crash? No. But it means that you thought that would never happen, and it did, so something's wrong with your safety case. It's not that their system acted overtly dangerously, but rather you now have evidence that your safety case has a problem, and you should fix that before you do have a crash. So a falsified safety case claim is there's something wrong with the safety case, and because you don't understand safety or your reason why you thought you were safe is incorrect, then you have to consider that you might be less safe than you thought you were. It's not necessarily a crash that's going to happen the next minute, so it's not a thing at runtime you slam on the brakes, but rather engineering feedback to go back and fix the problem. You do root cause analysis, and that root cause analysis might reveal you have a product defect or a process defect, or your safety argument is constructed incorrectly, or maybe there's a missing part of the argument that didn't occur to you and this incident reveals it, or maybe your supporting evidence has gaps, it's biased, there's just corrupted data, who knows? Some of your evidence may not be right. Or maybe there's an assumption error. We just assumed this thing would never happen, and look at that, it happened, and sure enough, that violated our claim. So the idea with SPIs is to look for the quality of the safety case itself, starting at road testing and going throughout the life cycle. Now that we have talked about SPIs, let's look at how safety feedback works during the life cycle. We have design, we have testing, we have deployment, and I added the safety case that's something that spans all of them. The architectures for autonomous vehicles will need to have support for field feedback across the life cycle. That's going to have to be built in for this technology to really deploy at scale safely. Today, we have a design and we do hazard analysis and we improve the design until the hazard is mitigated. And then we do testing and the testing reveals some sort of triggering events and we go back and we account for those in the design and we iterate and iterate and then we deploy. Today, when we deploy, we have some runtime safety monitors. Now, if you have a human-driven vehicle, that's the driver. Uh, if you have an automated vehicle, that's the runtime safety monitor set that says something like, oh, I'm too close to the car in front of me, I'll command the control system to slow down. You still want those, but those are not SPIs. They sound kind of the same, I'll never be too close, so I'm going to slow down. But runtime safety monitors take an action in the moment, but they don't fix the problem. So if you had a runtime safety monitor activating every mile, this diagram wouldn't change that. It would activate every mile for the life of the car. What you want is something to do better. You want to not put yourself in danger in the first place by using some sort of engineering feedback. Now, currently, we do recalls. Something bad happens on the road, and there's an engineering recall. That recall is not the visit to the uh, repair shop to get it fixed. Recall is the engineering process to notify everyone that there's a problem and to drive a fix so the fix that gets deployed. So the recall is the process, not the actual fix, to be clear. And we use a recall process to go back and fix the design and test and deploy a remedy. With safety performance indicators, we're going to change how we think about that. 
SPIs link design issues and testing issues and deployment issues back to the safety case. And so instead of waiting for tens or hundreds of incidents or perhaps injuries or perhaps even fatalities before we realize a recall is needed, we want much stronger instrumentation to change to a continuous improvement model where in a deployment, there was a near miss. You don't wait for someone to complain. You don't wait for there to be a visit to hospital. You say, that's not right. Our safety case said that shouldn't happen. It just happened. Let's go figure it out and fix it with high probability before we have the crash. And so SPIs will move you away from a recall model to a continuous improvement model that is likely to improve safety. Now, this does not mean you deploy unsafe and use SPIs to make it safe later. You deploy with a good faith belief that you're safe and a healthy respect for the fact that there's uncertainty around that knowledge and the SPI's feedback data both during testing and after deployment to make sure you're really as safe as you think you are and to also detect changes in the environment that pushed you out of safe into unsafe because something about the environment changed that you had no control over. Now let's pop into another ethics topic. Let's look at risk versus safety. Everything until now has been about risk. Let's reduce risk. If you look at safety, it's often about assessing the risks and mitigating the risk. But there's a really important point here when you no longer have a human driver to make the really hard decisions. Now that you have a system in complete control of the vehicle and there's no human driver to credit or blame for bad outcomes, ethics come to the fore. Sure, you need to get the risk right, but you need to balance safety on top of that. Now, you can say... Well, if you have excessive risk, that will drive improvement and make you safe. For example, you can say, well, the cost of insurance will make sure we're safe because if we're unsafe, we'll have too many crashes and the insurance rates will be too high. Well, it's true that reducing risk tends to improve safety, but it doesn't get you all the way to as safe as you want to be. It only gets you part of the way. And the reason has to do with the economics. Affordable risk might exceed acceptable safety. You can be riskier than you want to be and still afford the insurance premiums. How do I know this? Well, I used to have life insurance for combat military personnel. Most people would not consider going into combat to be an average type of risk for, for normal population, uh, but it's easy to get life insurance. No, no problem there. You can buy insurance for commercial space launches. You can buy insurance for motorcycles. Motorcycles are much more dangerous than regular passenger vehicles. But it turns out the insurance is kind of cheap, partly because the property damage involved with a car motorcycle crash is a lot less than the property damage between two cars. Uh, so that tells you the insurance rates aren't about safety. They're about financial compensation, but often they're about repairing the crash damage, which is a lot less for motorcycles. So just because the cost of the insurance is low does not make it safe. Also, with the autonomous vehicle companies that are burning 2 to $5 million per day, if you look at the cost of a fatality settlement, which might be right in that ballpark, well, if you have a fatality settlement that costs about one day's worth of burn rate, you know, maybe you just look at that as the cost of doing business. I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm saying that's a pragmatic thing if you're running a company to say, yeah, we can afford a fatality. It's only one day's worth of expenses. And should we delay our time to market by months or years to get our safety better? Or should we just roll the dice and decide that, well, you know, if we have to settle fatality. It's not that much money compared to the billions of dollars you're spending. It's a significant ethical issue here. So risk management is a nice start, but it is not enough to assure safety for typical stakeholders. The cost of insurance will not make you be safer than a human driver. If you can afford insurance twice as expensive as human driver insurance, it's not that much money, especially when you're struggling to get the first 10 or 100 cars working. You get to 10 million cars, maybe it's a different story, but that's not where we are right now. Even if the money worked out the same, there's also a risk transfer. What if you find out that your autonomous vehicle kills zero occupants but kills twice as many pedestrians as human drivers? that's going to be a problem for the pedestrians. That's not going to go over well with the public. Also, there's going to be existential pressure for the company to deploy with unproven safety, even if you can buy the insurance. You've got a deadline coming up and you have a choice. You do the demo, you do the deployment, not sure what your risk is, or the funders pull the capital and you've got a business. 
there's a lot of incentive to roll the dice and do the demo, and that's not a good thing for ethics. The number one ethical issue in this area, I think, is deployment governance. Who decides it's time to deploy an autonomous vehicle based on what? And how transparent is that? There's plenty of pressure for aggressive deployments. You may not know whether you're safe enough. You may believe in your heart you're safe, but there's no data to back it up, so you're not really sure. And you may deploy anyway, because your investors and other business stakeholders are putting pressure on you to de deploy, potentially pressuring you with the threat that your company goes away if you don't deploy right now. And it's very hard to resist that kind of pressure. There's probably missing independent technical oversight. In most companies, the team knows what's going on and no one else does. So where's the check and balance? How do you know whether you're deploying based on wishful thinking or an objective view that, yeah, you have safety taken care of? An ethical deployment should address whether or not you've disclosed publicly how safe you think you're going to be. And if you're going to be more dangerous than a human driver, you should d disclose that and explain why that's okay. You know, maybe it's okay because you've closed off the road and you're making sure there's no innocent bystanders during your test area. You know, maybe people are okay with that, but you need to be transparent. You can't just say we're really safe and not even know if you're safe or not. You need to include stakeholder concerns. There's stakeholders other than the companies and the economic development folks in the local government. The other folks sharing the road are definitely stakeholders and they're being put at risk by these deployments. You need to be transparent about your data and your processes. How safe are you? How many crashes are you really having? How many of the crashes were because your safety drivers were not paying attention as they should have been? Those numbers might be embarrassing, but to do anything less than be transparent is not being open with the stakeholders about safety. You need to be accountable for any losses. It should be straightforward for anyone harmed by the technology to get appropriate compensation. And you need to be non-discriminatory in the operational concept. There are a lot of the ways this goes that are a whole nother talk but it's easy for the technology to be based on biased training data that puts some groups at a disadvantage or to have operational concepts that put some segments of the population at more risk than others. Up until now, I've had a very technical view of what safety means. But we have to realize these vehicles are being deployed in a society made up of people. It's not all engineers. It's not all techies. And so we need to step back a minute and think about what we mean by safe. And what happens here is you ask seven people what safe means, you'll get eight or nine or ten answers of what safe means. For example, you may say, well, we're safe because we were able to buy insurance. And we've already discussed that that doesn't get you all the way to safe. It only gets you part of the way to safe. Or you might say, well, human drivers are bad, so computers will be safe. Sure, humans make mistakes. They're not as bad as you might think. We saw the numbers. But computers make mistakes, too. And safety engineering is all about making sure that we've figured out what mistakes they'll make and prevented them. If you don't put in sufficient safety engineering effort, there's a good chance that computers will be worse than people at driving. So you can't just automatically assume computers will be better. You may say, I have a safety case supported by evidence. And you can tell I'm, put, I'm putting the ones I like better down at the bottom. You know that, That's a pretty good reason to think you're safe. Uh, safety is our number one priority. Well, that's just a slogan. Uh, it might be true if you have a strong safety culture, but it might just be a slogan. Uh, we have positive risk balance if you have some data to back that up. But we've already discussed that there are things that, other than positive risk balance, you know, positive risk balance against which baseline and what are the ethical considerations. We have safe driving behavior. We know how to follow the traffic laws. We, know, we have good roadmanship. Yeah, that's great, but that's only part of safety. The other part of safety is what happens when things get weird. Do you keep your vehicle safe? That's kind of the hard part. We've tested and simulated for millions of miles. Well, it's millions instead of billions, so it only gets you so far. Again, it's good, but it's not enough. And we conform to safety standards. That's great, but you need more than that. So what really happens is, by safe, you sort of need all these things. So what I've done is I've put together a hierarchy of safety needs. For those of you who remember your freshman psychology, this is... Maslow's hierarchy repurposed into autonomous vehicle safety. So I'm calling it a hierarchy on purpose. I'm building it the same way, and the meaning is kind of the same. So down at the bottom, we have basic driving functionality. If the AV cannot drive down the road without hitting something, that autonomous vehicle is going to have a problem. That's sort of the that's sort of table stakes, okay? 
But you also want defensive driving. It has to drive in a way that doesn't get it into high-risk situations in the first place to get that level of human safety that more mature human drivers are at. Now, the thing about this pyramid is you're not on any one level. As you add levels, you have to do all the ones below or you fall down to a lower level. So by the time we're done, you have to do everything here, not just one thing. You need to do hazard analysis. That's the initial building block of safety engineering. Figure out what can go wrong, figure out ways to mitigate the hazard. You have to do functional safety, ISO 26262, which deals with, and I'll be very loose here and say, internal faults. There are problems inside the system, and functional safety explains to you how to deal with those in a safe way. But there's also safety of the intended function, and I'll be really loose here and say that has more to do with faults in the requirements and faults in the external world and faults in your sensors aren't going to be perfect. You're going to lose the occasional radar pulse coming back and things like this. You also need to do that. You also need to do system safety. There's things other than driving safety. Driving is part of it, but there's also securing the cargo and making sure the passengers are in the right position. There's a bunch of other things that have to do with the system and its context and how it interacts with other road users, post-crash response, all sorts of things. And NCE UL4600 takes that broader view and includes those on top of everything else. The social technical issues, stakeholder expectations, all those questions about what did you mean by safe, you have to answer all those questions. All those things have to be addressed. And at the top is a just culture for safety culture. Now you might ask, gee, shouldn't you be doing just culture at the beginning? And so this is not a model of how to do it. I would say you have to start with a good safety culture. This is more a model of how I see companies building up from the bottom up. First, they try and get it to drive, then they get it to drive better, and then they add safety. So this is kind of a how companies behave kind of hierarchy as opposed to an ideal. But eventually, all these things have to happen. And until you get the entire pyramid handled, you're not really ready to deploy in a safe way. Security also matters. Security has its own pyramid that sort of shows up in the middle levels there. And this talk is not about security, but don't forget security. That will have to happen as well. If you have a system that is insecure and people can corrupt the software images, that's going to lead to safety problems as well. Wrapping up, let's go back all the way up to the big picture of how safe is safe enough. Well, you need to be safe enough to deploy, and that's going to have to address the following factors. By the way, don't forget safety while you're public road testing, SAE J3018, is a standard for public road testing safety that everyone should be following. And the decision to do road testing is also a kind of a deployment decision. But in terms of deploying without a driver in the car, you have to realize that acceptable safety is more than just a risk number. It's not just some number you pick out of the average fatalities per mile. You need a good baseline human driver to compare against that is apples to apples for your particular deployment, and you need to add a safety factor for unknowns because there will be unknowns. You also should be following safety and security industry engineering standards. Why? Because that also helps you manage the risk of the unknowns. You also need to address the ethical and stakeholder concerns. So it's not just the number. You have to handle all these aspects of safety if you really want to be safe enough to deploy. This isn't going to happen without a written safety case. You need a transparent argument based on evidence to get all this stuff straight. It's not just drive around in a simulator, count up how many crashes you had and declare the number good enough. You have to really think about all these factors and have something written down that other folks can understand so you can communicate why they should believe you're safe enough to deploy. You're also going to need to do life cycle uncertainty management via feedback. There will always be unknowns, and even if there aren't unknowns, there will be, but even if there aren't, the world's going to change out from under you. So you're going to need life cycle feedback using safety performance indicators. Back to the number one ethical issue. Who decides when to deploy based on what is the number one ethical issue? And all the things above that line in this slide should be under consideration to decide when it's time to deploy. The stakeholders not just the people with a financial interest in the company succeeding, but the other people sharing the road and the regulators. Everyone needs to be involved in setting the safety criteria and ideally making the decision because it may be the company with its investment on the line, but everyone else using the road is also being put at risk by this technology. It needs to be done thoughtfully, transparently, and with safety as top of mind.
The safety culture is the last piece. A strong safety culture means that if there's a problem, people can say there's a problem and it will be resolved. That needs to be strong because otherwise you're not going to have fair dealing with all the stakeholders in making this decision. If you're going to deploy, you need to deal with all these things to have a safe enough AV deployment.